Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We thank you for taking time out of your busy day to watch our videos. We do pray that our studies in the Word of God and in the history of the faith will be a blessing to those that are following along. Friends, as I have studied and researched this history, it has been a great blessing to me to see how God has kept His Word. How that the promise of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has been maintained. That that is to say that the gates of hell have not prevailed against his type of church. His type of church has existed from the very time that he built and created that church there in Jerusalem. And it is, we have a, and we may not be able to find it and say we can trace it 100% in history. But by faith we know it's there. And the, the witness that we have seen in this, and which we, I can tell you, you'll see as we go on through it, is that there were churches there, and that the faith was increasing, and that their persecutors, if it were not for the power they had through their church states, would not have been able to do what they did to them. But even this also, is it not what Christ said, that we would suffer persecution? That even as they had hated him, they would hate us and persecute us. And that being a sign, my friends, that those who were persecuted in history unto death are God's people. We say, oh, well, we can't prove all they believed. By their actions, we know what they believed. They gave their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And... The overwhelming majority of them did not seek to take up arms and to fight for their life and for their freedom. We're still here in this 16th century, looking at the history thereof, but we're drawing close to the end of it. Here in the year 1572, we read of a, another pious Christian. Another virtuous Christian who was martyred. And we're reading it says at this time, and this here coming from history, uh, that uh, comes from different books and places. Uh, we'll mention some of these eventually too. We've mentioned Mart Martyr's Mirror, but we do have a few others that we have looked to and found. You can find this information. Uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs and another one. Uh, then there are several newer ones that's uh, really, I think, really print a lot of what's already in those. But, uh, again, in the year 1572, it says, At this time there was imprisoned at Dort in Holland a man of great virtue and piety named John Wutrus von Keek, who, in a letter written to his wife, relates what happened to him in prison on account of the faith. Among other things, he speaks of what the bailiff in his presence demanded of the judge, namely, that present to the decree of the king, he should be burnt alive at the stake because he had departed from the Roman Catholic faith and had, as he said, been rebaptized by the Anabaptists. Yes, that's what we've seen. We've seen the persecution of the Anabaptists, who were known by many different names as, uh, you know, they're prominent preachers, ministers, pastors, that became known by their name, and uh, oftentimes, whether it be Waldenses or Albergenses or different ones that their enemies, their persecutors, the Papists, would nickname, oh, you're just one of Waldenses' people. You're just one of Albergenses' people. You're just one of this one's people or that one's people. Just as we might, they might say to that group over there in whatever city, well, you're of that city or you're of this city over there. Because the Lord's churches are local, visible, independent bodies of baptized believers who stood independently under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God, 
carrying out the great commission given unto the churches of the Lord, and they were persecuted by the powers that be, the church states, even as it was said that they would be. Moving on, in 1592, we find that besides the disputation held against some Papists who maintained infant baptism, Bartholomew Patton, Penton, Bartholomew Penton, a pious brother also left before his departure from this world a testament as a last farewell to his little daughter, in which he, among other things, admonishes her how she, when arriving at maturity, should act with regard to this matter, saying, My dear child, Take this to heart, and when you attain your understanding by parental request, to you is to join those who fear God, who are by far the least among all the people, but who are nevertheless the true congregation of the church of God, who practice their rule according to the ordinance of the Lord, and the practice of the apostles, namely a baptism which is founded upon faith and must be received as a Christ or must be received as Christ has commanded and as it or and as is written in Matthew. In other words, he's telling her that those who practice believers baptism. That when she comes old enough to understand and believe she should seek them out and be baptized or right by them. And not put her faith and trust in the religious systems of men, of the church state, who would say, oh, but we took care of that when you were a baby. For they did not. It is a false hope. In this century, in these times, as we've looked and considered what is before us, and I think those, probably, those two stories can be found in Mars Mirror, if I remember properly. Uh... These people that we have mentioned, these Anabaptists, and going all the way back to the 2nd, 3rd, 4th centuries, when there first began to be that distinct division between what we would call faithful churches, holding to the teachings of the apostles, of the teaching, even the teaching of the Word of God, and to those who began to go astray that became churches in error, who had uh, pastors over them that began to desire to be over more than one group of people in different locations, and those who began to hearken unto the voice of Rome, of that Roman emperor who said, Come unto me, all ye pastors, and join me, and we will go forth and conquer the world in the symbol of the cross. An idol which he lifted up and saw in a dream. Well, God, by his word, is not going to give to any of us the idea to lift up an image, to lift up an idol, and go forth and proclaim his word, and proclaim submission and belief unto God by and under the idol. We know that that was not of God. But Constantine done this very thing, and he sent out to roughly, I think it was 1800 churches or bishops, pastors, it was, it was the bishops, which means there could have been more than 1,800 churches since there were some over more than one. But to those 1,800, if I remember right, an overwhelming majority ignored him. And some of the groups of them sent back requests or sent back letters stating, what, do the, what does the church of the Lord have to do with the emperor? And what do the bishops have to do in the court of the emperor? There's no connection there. You have no authority over us. We have no authority over you. That is the distinction. There's where even the first real true principle of separation of the political power and the religious power is set forth. Now, of all those groups, and you can go back to there, and it's the ones that started in Africa, and as they spread up into Europe and all these that would be called Anabaptists, 
these all have certain peculiar things which we can find and believe and know that they held these Anabaptists, that which would become Baptists, believe these things. They believed in salvation by grace alone, not by any works, not by anything that men might do. They believed that the gospel must be preached all over the world. And that was and is the Great Commission. We go unto all the world and preach to everyone the gospel of Jesus Christ. They believed in believer's baptism done by a true church only to be right and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We've seen and we are seeing that in this study of history of those throughout these ages who believed, suffered, and died for their belief in believer's baptism. That's the, the battle line. Not over many of these other things which people will be fighting over later on and even today which they argue over. But this one thing that you must believe and be able to profess faith in the Lord. If you believe with all your heart you may be baptized. A child has no understanding of these things especially one who is a babe and cannot speak, cannot utter but lay there and cry. Not knowing, well, why is it I'm being made wet with this water? Oh, someone poured water upon my, whatever this is here in my head. You know, a child doesn't understand this existence, who and what they are, and what is going on around about them, but they do understand that there is that one who holds them dear, and that is being their mother in their, her arms, they feel safe. But one must be old enough to profess faith, and it is because it's one thing we understand, though, this, that the baptism does not save you. It does not add unto your salvation. It does not take away from your salvation. And anyone that's honest about history and, and knows that they only baptized two times a year back in these days, even at this point still yet, was the custom to baptize two times a year. Those things have changed. These, those early days, still talking about those early days, 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, as these groups began to be separated, or that is, uh, by their oppressors, by their uh, persecutors, began to nickname them and mock them because of what they were doing, because they would rebaptize those who came out of heresy who came out of the false teaching of these who had gone after false doctrine, they'd rebaptize. These Anabaptists believed that the members of the, of the church should be saved members. And this is not true with the church states. They made everybody to be a member of that church in each city that they were baptized unto it when they were children, became members of it. But that's not so in the Lord's church. Only those that are saved and are then baptized are made members of that local visible assembly. Godly living. They also believed in in church discipline. We see less and less of that as the days go on. The churches, many churches stop disciplining their members. And look at the condition our nations are in. The, God, the people of God are not very godly, we would have to say. They were anti-Rome and anti-church state. For those two things go hand in hand. Rome was the first one. The first one to create a church state. And her daughters followed after her example. And did the same things. They believed the Bible was the only rule for the churches. The only rule of all faith and practice is the Word of God. Now they had it in their languages in those early days. And we have it in our language today. And we've mentioned this many times. It's the old King James Bible. Which God brought into existence when it was needed. And it still stands as the rock an example 
for all others to compare themselves to, for they do. All modern translations compare themselves to the old King James. Now, they don't even compare themselves to their uh, first editions or first uh, printings. Uh, these modern Bibles that many of them that have been revised and, re and new editions that have come out, well, they, again, they don't compare themselves to their previous editions. They compare themselves to the King James Bible, for she is the benchmark. That is the one to beat. That's the one to try to outshine, or at least to make you think that they're better, but they are not. The Word of God is our final authority. Those Anabaptists, they, they baptized all that did not have true baptism. And my friends, taking a bath is not baptism. Every time your parents or your mother in particular bathed you as a child growing up, that wasn't baptism. Doesn't matter whether you were uh, put in a tub of water or she took and poured it over your head, that wasn't baptism. No more than it was for some person uh, when you were a babe to take a little water and put on your head. That wasn't baptism either. The baptism in the Word of God represents burial represents digging a hole and burying something that is dead in the ground and covering it up. Even as one who's buried in a tomb. And then comes back to life, even as Lazarus. And the, they opened it up and he came rolling out of there, or however he came out, he was all bound up. Uh, you'd have to think, well, he could do a little more than roll, or if he was able to get up right, he could hop, maybe. But Lazarus came forth at the call of Jesus and he commanded them then to unbind him. He was all wrapped up head to toe in that stuff. God is the one who quickens and makes alive and it is not by the works of men, not by the ordinances or so-called sacraments. But it is by the grace of God that we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ, and that alone. And if you properly study the Word of God, you will understand that. But there are those who want to take things out of context, and that don't want to compare Scripture with Scripture to know the truth. And they were peace-loving people, not fighting back or making war against their enemies. And we found this to be true of all of them, except for those, I uh, believe it was the Hushites. I mean, that was a tribal nation. That was a nation of people. And when their leader was murdered by the Papists, who they had already said, oh, we guarantee your safety, they lied. And it started a war, just as there were other times that wars were started. And even after the uh, Protestants came out, there were wars between them and Rome as they fought one with another because Rome did not want to lose their power over them. And in many of them, such as in England, as uh, sympathetic Catholic rulers gained the throne, kings and queens alike, they sought to put them back under the thumb of Rome. But those Protestants and others, the Protestants rebelled and they continue to fight for the cause of liberty from Rome and also we find that the Baptists joined them and the Baptists are the descendants of the Anabaptists. By this time there is already a church in England that has existed for two centuries called the Hillcliffe Baptist Church and that church is documented in the records of its region not just the records of those who were members of the church, for the book is written by a member of the church whose dad happened to be one of the pastors. But he uses the documentation, not just of the records of the church, but of the local magistrates and offices and things, the information gained from the cemetery of that church and the dates of those tombstones that are there and the archaeological evidence of the church building itself and a well-cemented, hidden baptistry to immerse the believer in the water. For it was, after all, in those days, 
made unlawful, illegal as those dippers dipped. These churches were all independent. Jesus was the only head over these churches. Yes, these are the descriptions of what we would mostly call Baptist churches today, even though uh, yeah, most all Baptist churches hold to these things, even though sadly, in many ways, some of them have fallen away from other principles and things that are taught to us in the Word of God. <clears throat> in 1516, the Byzantine-type text, also called majority text, traditional text, ecclesiastical text, Constantinople text, the Antiochian text, or Syrian text, the received text, are as it is best known. The Textus Receptus is one of the main text types. It is the form found in the largest number of surviving manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. And uh, information gained on this was uh, from 2020. And at that time, there were over 6,000 manuscripts that, they, that had been examined. And that they knew of what type they all were, whether they were Byzantine or Alexandrian. And the exact number is like 6,050, I think, or 50-something, about like that. And out of all of those, only about 45 or so are Alexandrian. And all the others are Byzantine or Traditional Textus Receptus. Traditional text. Textus Receptus. 99% of them are supportive of the King James Bible. Less than 1% of them support the false Bibles to my right here. And I have a few more right over here. And that's one of those things that people, you know, there's pe these, these people even lie about this. These people that hold to these modern translations will outright lie about what these manuscripts support. And that's a shame upon you that are out there that would do such thing. The New Testament texts of the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Pentecostal text, as well as the uh, utilized, as well as those utilized in the lecturons, are based on this text type. While varying in less than 0.05% uh, of the text, it also underlies the Textus Receptus Greek text used for most Reformer Pentecostal translations of the New Testament into vernacular languages. The Textus Receptus, majority text, was first published by Erasmus in the early 1500s. He gathered together the manuscripts and published the Greek New Testament for the first time in 1560. Now I can tell you that when we go on up there to about six, at 1611, we will give a detailed list then. We just did this the other week at church. But we'll give a detailed list of the history of the Bible translation starting from the very beginning of the Hebrew, the Greek, and those uh, many different ones that were, came out of that after that, uh, the Italian, the Latin Vulgate, uh, the Gothic, and uh, these many different printings of the Greek text. First of all, Erasmus's four or five editions, Beza's, and the others that all come along, and how that all falls into place. And as the, at that time, getting into it, we're in this right now at our church, talking about the King James Bible, its creation, and what people say about it, and the so-called problems that are being heralded as the reason you ought not hold it in your hand, trust it as the Word of God, and how vain they are. They really, they're, they're so pointless that it's a shame that any falls prey to them. It's without faith. You have you don't have faith in the Word of God. You don't have the faith that your ancestors have had. We ought to have faith in the Word of God. We ought not pay heed to these seducing spirits. 
these gainsayers, these scoffers that want to cast doubt on the Word of God. Now, what we're going to be getting into here next week now are the languages of the Word of God. And I mean by that, I mean the Hebrew, the Chaldee, which some today call Aramaic, and then the Greek language. Those original languages. And if I remember right, uh, this may be where we begin to talk about even after that, of uh, the coming of the English language, the uh, how the English became the language of the world, and uh, how it, uh, the world began to change. And that old language of Latin that has, had become a dead, was becoming a dead language and is a dead language today, that would be kept alive by Protestant, uh, by, not Protestantism, the Popists or Papists, Roman Catholicism, they keeping that alive, trying to keep in that the Word of God and keep it away from the common people, at least they know and understand, and even though it be an error, still there's some truth there. But fortunately, by the grace of God, the Greek Orthodox Church long ago had said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to keep these Greek texts, and we're going to keep reading these Greek texts, and we're going to keep teaching and preaching from these Greek texts, the Word of God. And by the grace of God, God used them to preserve the Greek text, and before Constantinople fell, those Greek texts were safely taken out, most of them, and they took them north and west unto Germany and England and up in those directions where Martin Luther would be influenced by them and many others. And where eventually those, as we'll, and we, there in that study of the making of the King James Bible, we give the list of the authors, or that is the translators, and of their qualifications to be able to do the work. And they outshine my friends, they outshine those today that are critics of them. Some out there even that uh, they've taken a semester in Greek language and they think they're qualified to judge those men for the work they did. What hypocrites. But we're going to look at the languages in the Bible, the Old Testament, Hebrew, and Chaldee, and what commentators had to say about that. And then we're going to look at the Greek Talk about the New Testament scriptures and these things that came to pass. And I think we've got about a minute here. But uh, that is what we will get into next week. Uh, because, and it may take us a couple of uh, videos to get through that. And uh, we'll look here real quick. The Greek, yep, we'll have that. And we'll also talk about the Latin. And... The Hebrew in the, that time period, and I believe we do over here some more. We'll get into, well, we're going to talk about preservation and that type of stuff after that. But I think that's part of it coming up here too, after we look at this segment of it, of those things, which could be a few weeks, and we will uh, address the English language and its uh, dawning, its coming into play. Friends, I pray that God would bless and keep you and that these studies would continue to be a help unto us all to have a greater faith and trust in our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I don't know if I had a minute.